And it has been a long time, too long, since Colin has graced this auditorium. But many of you know that he's spoken with us several times in the past and always brings an amazing and unique perspective and a kind of a dry wit that um, skewers the pretense of much of um, what might happen in contemporary art. He is a British, as you'll hear, film and media study theorist, uh, currently living in Lompoc, but perhaps if he retires next year, he might be going further afield, but we know we'll always be able to lure him back, or at least we trust that we will. <laughs> Working at the intersection of film, philosophy, and interdisciplinary media theory, he received his BA and MA in history from St. John's College, Cambridge, and PhD in cinema studies at UCLA before becoming, and this is where you see his multiple skills, professor of critical theory and integrative studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he teaches in the Department of Art, Film and Media Studies, Comparative Literature, and the History of Art and Architecture. Colin has worked extensively with the Santa Barbara Museum of Art as blogger, panelist, and lecturer, even riffing with actor and author Michael Imperioli on the stage about Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground, <laughs> and has spoken to the docents multiple times over the years, including on artist Diana Thader and Valeska Suarez, among many others. So this morning we're zeroing in post-Valentine's on scenes from a marriage. Colin has been a longtime writer and contributor to Art Forum, in which he reviewed both Ed and Nancy's work, as well as, as you'll hear in his own raconteur style, dipping in and out of their world, um, has some good tales to tell there. So we're so delighted to welcome him back to share his insights. Please join me in saying welcome to Colin Gardner. And I should say one more thing. We have struggled with some technological difficulties this morning. Colin and Nick both moved with great grace, as did Molly, to try and save the day. So if there's a little bit of a pause and the dance steps aren't quite in tune, it has nothing to do with Colin. It may have everything to do with technology. That's why we're in art. So, please, Colin. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a treat being here. And uh, yes, Michael Imperioli was the last time I uh, did something in this room. It was a wonderful event. And um, I wanted to start off today uh, with a quote from Robert Pincus, the art critic, uh, currently at the San Diego Union. But in the 80s, Robert and I uh, wrote for the LA Times together. And we covered the gallery scene, usually doing three or four reviews a week. So it was nice to discover that Robert had uh, published a book on the uh, Keenholz. Uh, the title of the book is On a Scale That Competes with the World, The Art of Edward and Nancy Redden Keenholz. And it came out in 1990. Um, the quote is this, Keenholz's art provides an intensified version of the given social world. It forces us to think about the darker, troubling, and more covert aspects of contemporary Western culture with a decided emphasis on American society by giving it back to us in a distorted form that strives to reveal its underlying cruelties. One thing that struck me with looking at the Keenholz's work was how they do take uh, elements from the everyday world, very familiar, like a, a nativity scene in the piece upstairs. Um, uh, but they uh, break it down, they separate it out, they reassemble it, and it freeze frame it, so that it's also very much about death. And so what is familiar to you suddenly becomes unfamiliar. You become alienated from it. But then they pump new life into it as art so that you see this familiar thing in a completely new way. It's darker, yes, imbued with death, but at the same time brought back to life in a new form. And that's the theme I wanted to uh, focus on. I'm starting off, though, with this very, very early work that you see up on the screen. This is untitled by Ed from 1954. And you can see, uh, oh, what happened there? So 
time. It's that piece. Um, and then he started to do more assemblage style work. My mother was an antique table from 56. <laughs> Another untitled work. Black with white. You can see it's very, very highly textured. And it's reminding me a lot of Jasper Johns' Fool's House from 1962. And you can see how he actually includes the broom um, and swishes it along the surface of the canvas. Uh, it turned out that Ed's work that I just showed you was not painted with a brush. It was painted with a broom, like that. He didn't include the broom, but again, it's very much about the highly textured materiality of the surface. 1958, Exodus. Again, again uh, an assemblage of found materials, often from swap meets, junk stores, trash bins, reassembled, uh, often with text, uh, but usually with a thick coat of broomed paint. Untitled 1958. This is in many ways the most decorative of the works from this period. But he also, um, in 1960, started to do these freestanding sculptures. And again, you can see figures like this in the works upstairs. This is the front and the reverse of Walter Hobbs. He founded Ferris Gallery with Walter Hobbs. And you can see that he is depicted in a very flamboyant way on the front. But then when you look at the back, uh, it's a lot darker. And that's a running theme with both of their work from this point on. One, that's a detail of the back, of, of the front end. And you can see that there are always little windows on a world that when you get closer to the work, you want to delve further. It suggests there's always an interior that is uh, never shown in, in its completeness. Key influence on him at this point was Robert Rauschenberg. This is his work, Monogram, from 1955 to 59, where you have the, uh, the goat's head surrounded by debris from everyday life, and uh, it becomes a kind of both an assemblage and uh, at the same time something that looks like it's a freeze frame from a storybook some kind. Now, he did a homage to Rauschenberg in 1960 based on this piece called Odious to Rauschenberg. <clears throat> and I fortunately could not find a picture of it to show you, but um, I do have a text describing how it works. He replaced the goat's head with a more plastic, rubbery animal head. And what was different about it was that it also rotated, whereas Rauschenberg's doesn't, and it plugged into the wall. It plugged into the room's electricity system. And this is what he said about it. Um, Built into that machine was a diathermy apparatus. A diathermy is an early medical radio radar kind of thing. And when you plug it in a diathermy machine, it just completely fucks up the television reception in that area. <laughs> so I figured that the movement of the head was enough to keep it plugged in, and people would say, oh, that's funny, and they would leave it on. And then there would be complaints going into the police station or the television station, and they'd send out trucks to discover what the trouble is in the community when you get a bad reception like that. Those trucks go around with little antennas, and they finally figure it out and whistle. They zero in on it. They would bust in on it, and they say, OK, and everybody gets a big fine and goes off to jail. I just thought it would be a really funny kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> He was going to send it to Rauschenberg and have the whole neighborhood's electricity shut down. <laughs> but he ended up not sending it. But it uh, gives you an idea of uh, the way he was thinking at the time. 
So a little bit of Jasper Johns, a little bit of Rauschenberg influence going on here. Um, very, very appropriate for the era. And uh, let me just get back to my slides. There we go. This is a piece called John Doe from 1958. And again, you can see it's almost uh, like an image of uh, mankind as uh, a kind of uh, disabled figure in a wheelchair, a figure that needs help. Jane Doe, 1960. Boy, the son of John Doe, with a car going through his body. Dwight D. Nutt, you can see that he's get now starting to combine painting with the 3D models of uh, humans. And on one level, they're very generic, but as I mentioned earlier, they kind of remind you of somebody you might know, too. So they kind of create a disjuncture effect, and this is very typical of his work at that point. But in 1961 to 62, he moved away from very individual pieces to create giant um, installations. And the most famous is a piece called Roxy. This is the entrance to the large multi-room installation. And Roxy is a whorehouse that he visited when he was a teenager. And he recreates it. Here's a larger detail, with a lot of, again, freestanding and seated figures, some painted in bright yellow, some in uh, more neutral colors, uh, but with real carpeting, real furniture. And you, the audience, are encouraged to walk around in it. You're going back into his memory as a walking space. Here's a large image of what Roxy looked like. It's not, not seductive like a whorehouse. It's actually very alienating. And again, this is very typical of those works during this period. Here's another image from, from it. <laughs> With a jukebox, of course. This is a gift for a baby, 1962. And it ties in with another running theme, with, which is birth and abortion. This is the illegal operation, 1962. There's no actual figure in it, but it's left to your imagination to put that figure in. And what you see is the residue of maybe a dead body or a dead baby. This is the birthday, 1964, where the mother is lying on the table with these giant feathers coming out of her body as if the baby has exploded into the world. This is America, my hometown, reduced to a kind of vacuum television set. This is the blink, blink frog. This is a, a period where he's very interested in TV and electronica in general. And so you have these um, elements uh, that are like a Rauschenberg found junk, but he imbues it with a more ethereal um, TV age aesthetic. Uh, if you were alive today, it would be basically digital. And so we have to think of this as a projection into the future. The sky is falling. Common theme here of a found object put on something that resembles a table or a chair, as if it's just part of the furniture. Again, just part of everyday life. But it, again, it's so disjunctive that it, you can't absorb it that way. It rubs you the wrong way. 
This is, of course, one of his most famous people pieces, Backseat Dodge, a couple having sex in the backseat of a Dodge car in the late 40s. And Ed was insistent that it had to be an accurate car from that period. And the couple are made up of uh, wiring, much, much of it not covered with paper to uh, reproduce flesh, so that they are in a state of disintegration while they are uh, necking in the back seat. This is a uh, piece of, uh, from 1964 to 6, the exterior of a piece called The State Hospital. It looks like a prison cell. Again, throwing you off kilter. And this is the interior. And two, like two dead bodies. And of course, as the public, you're allowed to open the door and go in most of these cases. Sometimes you can only peek in through a peephole. I think you're allowed into this one. This is the wait, uh, an elderly woman sitting in a chair with a photograph for her face, with pictures of her youth surrounding her, but it's almost like she's waiting to die. This is what another piece really imbued with death. The use of photographs becomes much more common with the collaborations with Nancy. Um, she's interested in the photo side of things, and they incorporate photos invariably as an element of a face, a view, uh, to get you outside of the interior. Um, this is, in many ways, the beginning. This is the per piece that's most personal to me, the beanery a wide angle from 1965. It's a reproduction of Barney's Beanery, the bar and pool hall on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. And he managed to get um, a few bits of furniture that they were throwing out and paid to replace them and use them in his own reproduction of the beanery. Now, what's interesting about it is that everyone he depicts is shown with a clock instead of a face. And the clocks are all stopped at 10 past 10, every single one. Now, I was in the UCSB bookstore yesterday, and in the clock section, I walked by them, and there were about 10 clocks, all stopped at 10 past 10. <laughs> and I thought, is this an inside joke? Have you been to the Keenholz show? And they said, no. And they, but they were all stopped at 10 past 10, which gives you an idea that this stuff carries over. <laughs> here's, here's another detail, so you can see the clock heads. And of course, it was no, notorious for the faggot stay out sign that they put inside and out. And Ed makes sure that you notice that. Now, Barney's is very personal to me because I used to play pool there pretty much every week. And one of my opponents was Sandy Weintraub. She was the producer of Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And she was the associate producer of Taxi Driver. And she used to just kill me every week. I, I never won a game against her in months. And I played this other guy who um, never actually put the pool cue on his other hand. He just went like this. And I never even got to shoot. <laughs> and one thing I didn't know was that my wife, Louise, was a waitress there at the time. And uh, I said, yeah, I used to play pool with Sandy Weintraub. And she said, oh, yeah, you were one of those Brits who never tipped. <laughs> I said, no, I did tip. But again, she was. I knew the bride when she used to rock and roll and when she was a waitress. So, uh, yeah. Another close-up. So, in a way, this is frozen time, 10 past 10, a time you can never actually get back from your life. 
I mean, I'm reminiscing about it, but um, I can't get that time back. It's gone. I'll never replace it. And so again, I'm sort of out of sync with my own life. And this work kind of reintroduces me to it, but on a whole other level. It's, it's almost like a, uh, a churchyard headstone to my memory. This is another famous piece, the Portable War Memorial um, from 1968. And at this point, Ed started to do drawings um, or paintings of a potential installation, and he would sell them separately. And this is how it looks in reality. Let me move, sorry. And the portable war memorial of the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima is now inserted into a living room, totally out of sync with uh, the environment that it's placed in. This is another famous piece, five car stud, um, that consists of uh, four cars of uh, white supremacists and another car of a black man who was having sex with a white woman. And the white supremacists grabbed him, pinned him to the ground, and castrated him. Now, this piece was bought by a Japanese collector. And it was put in storage for 40 years. And no one saw it. And then when that collection was sold, Nancy managed to get hold of it and restored it. And it was put back onto the museum circuit so the general public could see it. It's a really eerie piece because it's uh, in darkness at night with a blinding light. And uh, then, of course, you see the, uh, the murder and the castration of the black man. And uh, it really freaks you out. One thing it reminded me of was George Siegel's work at this same time. This is the execution. But what Siegel tended to do was to um, make it all very generic. He didn't personalize the victims in his works. They're usually just white like this. Whereas um, the Keenholzers went out of their way to make it very personal, even make it seem like, oh, I, I knew somebody like that, to make it much more jarring much more powerful. And this is a piece called Sordi from 1971 that has five car stud as a photograph in a car's side window. And you view from inside the car as if you are a bystander witnessing the event but not interfering. It puts you on the spot as a guilty party. And this is um, a beginning of another series of works uh, called Concept Tableau from the late 60s. This one is After the Ball is Over, number one. And to the right is a description of a piece that hasn't been made yet. And you can either buy the combination of this, a drawing of the piece that is yet to be made for more money, or the piece itself as a tableau for even more money. I'll just read you the opening of the description. This tableau is to be built in the town of Fairfield, Washington. It will be an existing two or three bedroom frame house with living room, kitchen, back porch, and it will have a driveway, walks, etc. And the yard will need perpetual care. All the windows are to be painted black or mirrored so the interior of the house is dark. The house will be furnished in 40s or 50s contemporary Sears and Roebuck farmer style. It will be complete and obviously functioning with four people in the inhabiting family. They have a dog and a four-door sedan which is parked in the driveway. To withstand the weather, it will probably be a shell of just the metal parts mounted on pipe standard or painted black or mirrored, etc. And so it goes on. 
So you have a choice of how you want to purchase this. And this, this is the American trip, another example of, of the concept of wealth. And then, to end with the EDGE survey, this is for $87 from 1969. And these are watercolors. And for the collector, they cost whatever figure he has painted on the paper. So you've got to pay $87 to get this. If it said $500, you've got to pay $500. Or if it just says $0.50, cents, you get it for $0.50. Cents. This is the carryover of Ed's connection of con connections of conceptual art that runs through his and Nancy's work. So we now need to move on to the uh, Ed and Nancy section. And I'm going to race through that because I definitely want to show some of Nancy's solo work. Nancy or Ed and Nancy, sorry. Nancy or Ed and Nancy? Ed and Nancy. Okay. So th these are uh, more examples of the watercolors, and of course, again, by price. Well, this one was a bad one. $998, but you could get one for 77 It's up to you. This is Dome Edition. It's a little carrying case that the two did together for a Dusseldorf show. And you can see again that they're also doing a sort of flat collage montage, carrying on with Ed's work from the early 60s. They're also doing drawings together at this stage. Another drawing. This is a drawing for the art show from 1974. And there's one, two, three, four. And the, from what you can see upstairs, you can see also how they like to work in continuing series with slight variations on each one. HID number eight. Very minimalist to start off with, but then they will start to get into installations. This is Coors A from 1974, and then Coors B with one slight letter variation change the, the, the nature of the work. But this blank white space that dominates the work is really new to Ed's work, and I think that's Nancy's influence. The gray window becoming. This is a lot like the piece upstairs. And one thing that they also like to do, if there's more than one figure in an installation, they're rarely making eye contact. The one upstairs, they're looking in opposite directions. They're in the same room. They're probably related as part of the same family. But they seem to be in a kind of personal breakdown. And that's a common theme that runs through their work. This is Still Life from 1974. The Bouquet from 75. And then a return to the kitchen table, another running theme, with photographs that Nancy now starts to introduce into the work. And again, there are a freeze framing of time, a time that is about reminiscence, but one you can't go back to. This is an installation, The Returning. 
Well, one thing you might notice with the piece upstairs that Nancy did that remember resembles a TV set, it's got a VHS stuck in it. It's really dated. It's video, not digital. And again, that's a reminder that that age has passed. This is Death Watch. Again, the TV theme, but as itself a, a sign of the death of something. What? Uh, intelligence, the death of interactivity, too passive a consumer. That's another theme that runs through their work. Somewhere a different drummer. Again, another machine plug-in resembling a TV, a wand, another TV. And of course, they're not working. It's not like that Rauschenberg piece that shuts down the electricity. Th th these are basically malfunctioning. Fountain. This is a, a series, White Easel with. And you can see that they've got certain um, assemblage elements, painting elements, but also foregrounding the easel itself here, foregrounding the mode of production. This is a installation piece. This is called Solly 17 from 1979. And uh, a lot of this work is um, based on um, Spokane, Washington, um, an area that was being demolished at the time. And they did little monuments to some of the buildings that are no longer with us. and. Uh, this was a, an apartment building. This is the entrance, and this is what it looks like on the inside. Figures, again, frozen in time, very alienated. And Nancy provided the photograph of Spokane through the window. Another TV influence, the blockhead. Rhinestone Beaver Peep Show. <laughs> Portrait of a mother with the past affixed. Another running theme of the photograph of the mother of a certain age, uh, often with one of uh, the mother as a child. And again, it's very much about the inability to reverse time. Jerry Can Standard, another TV. The Jesus Corner. This is again uh, very typical of the work of the time where it's an exterior and then a door that's um, bidding you to go in. And then you're wondering what's going to be inside this? And then more often than not, it's found objects with uh, a certain death streak running through them. This is um, the Petticord Apartments Lobby. This is another Spokane apartment building that was being demolished. This is the entrance that you walk into. And then this is the kind of thing you see uh, along the way. This is the night clerk at the Young Hotel. Again, with a, with a Nancy photograph as the person's face. This is the Hörengracht. The model. Now, this one is one of my favorites. This is the Ozymandias Parade from 1985. 
and uh, Ozymandias is originally a sonnet written by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Dates from 1818. Ozymandias was the Greek name for the Pharaoh Ramesses II. And it's basically about death again. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip in sneer of cold command, tell that its sculptor well those passions read that yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. It's almost a description of every Ed and Nancy Pete. <laughs> but of course, it's, it, they portray it as this um, carnival parade float. It's just full of fun and rhythm. show two more, and then we'll move on to uh, Nancy. This is The Caddy Court from 1986-7 with a Cadillac with this strange opening rising out of the middle. And then when you look inside, it's this grotesque series of animals and humans So again, a common theme that runs through the Keen Holtz's work is this idea that the luxury item, like a Cadillac or a car, can be a scene for brutal sex, uh, ultimately castration, in, in the case of the poor black guy, or in this case, a, a kind of um, court of uh, monsters who are judging you. So if you could move on to the uh, Ed and Nancy's, um, I'll show you um, Elvis. Okay, this is the Heartland assemblage to show that uh, in, even in the mid-90s, she's continuing the Keenholz's interest in 3D work, but in this case with her own photographic basis. The Blue Bird of Peace from 97. Drawing for Howe Mountain which is a lot of penises. Ilsa's Home, again, a combination of painting and 3D. The Golden Rule. <laughs> She's got a really good sense of humor. Cradle to Grave, again, a repeat of this theme of child's birth, but also the potential of miscarriage. Shirley and Friends. And then a series of 
works that she did uh, several versions of. Um, this is bigoted tolerance. And you have the two words clearly uh, on either side, but in the middle, they overlap with each other, like the face-to-face -face portrait upstairs. And putting the blurred one in the middle, that is the one that draws your attention first. And then you need, need clarity from the other two. This one is east-west, blurred in the middle, true-false. But you can start to apply it to icons, to Buddha and Jesus. And then Liberty Valley, the Statue of Liberty out of context. Santa and Christ. I don't think she's doing this dialectically to create a true-false collision. She's deliberately blurring them together to create a kind of noise effect when they are not distinguishable from each other. Uh, Michel Serre, the philosopher, uh, always applies the term noise to what he calls uh, the parasite. Parasite for him is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a, an unclear melding together of a new hybrid that you can't quite make sense of. And that's what Nancy is doing in a way with this. This is uh, Shirley and Angel. And then a few more of her later word pieces, Boogie Woogie. Flip Flop. Jazz jive, rock and roll. Buffalo Bill. <laughs> <laughs> She's very fond of playing on words. But then also Jim Crow. Soldier's Cross. Manscape. Paved Street. Primary colors, religious symbols. Twelve step. <laughs> It's like a, a, a long haul, that one. And then finally, fire. Oops. It's not coming up for some reason. Oh, well, anyway, we can end with 12-step <laughs> recovery. <laughs> so I definitely wanted to give Nancy her own solo act there.
prevalent of mental illness in this country. The earliest people who first had that are the people yeah. that are in the adult community. Mike, I think you bring up an interesting point. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-